Meet Glenn, a globally award-winning theatre director who moved from Australia to India nine years ago. He shared with me his experience as a Westerner in Mumbai, the essential role of the black market in India, and why Indian boys grew up with a deep sense of intimacy towards each other. I'm Max, an entrepreneur and YouTuber from Singapore. Let's go! I remember when I first sort of moved here and I thought, where do I buy eggs? And I was really unsure of where I go for <laughs> eggs. And all of a sudden it became this like epic movie about my journey to find eggs. I love that about being yeah. here is that daily there was an or still is an adventure. It, it's fantastic. And the other big thing for me that I love here is that because there is a language barrier a lot of the time, you have to be aware of how you communicate. Your tone and your body language and even pace, you know, and the speed of your talking. And you have to be acutely aware of how you communicate as a human mm. being and what signals you're giving off. Exactly, yeah. It's not automatic anymore. Because no. like growing up in Australia, I guess it was like, it's your nature. Like you, you yeah. talk, you don't, you don't think how you talk. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, you know, I mean, I think the statistic is we only hear, when we're talking, we only hear by 18% orally and the rest of it is visual, you know, body language and tone and sound. Yeah. And so when you've actually got the language barrier, that becomes really, really important. I lived in Bandra for a while and um, there was a guy I used to walk past twice a day who sold belts and fixed belts, sat on the ground and fixed belts. And I used to stop and have a chat to him like for 10 minutes, nearly every day. We could not understand one single word of each other, but we would sit and we would communicate and we'd even have jokes, you know. <laughs> I became really, really aware of, of these other levels of communication and which for me, you know, as a theatre maker and directing actors and how to portray people communicating, it became sort of intrinsic in my work as well. Look, there's one thing I do know about nearly every Indian I've met is they're so intelligent with language. You know, they all have four, five, six languages in their head. Most Westerners have one. You know, certainly in Australian, mm -hmm. most of us have one. And these people have all these languages in their head. And that's why Hindi is so difficult to learn here because you learn a word on one side of the road you cross the road mm. and I say, no, 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 you say it like this uh -huh. because it's a very multicultural city. You have a lot of language on the street. It's incredible. Well, this is really interesting. There's two of these apparently in Mumbai where it's the same builder because this is the Versova bus station. Okay. And he leases the roof of the bus station oh. and builds the apartments. <laughs> that's smart. And that's Mumbai. <laughs> that's Mumbai. It's amazing. In China and India, it's like two huge economies, like two mm -hmm. like biggest countries in the world, like growing super fast. But China is more like super regulated, so super clean, yeah, and yeah. super organized, it's like top down organized. Mm. And India feels like it's it's more like self organized. I'm no expert on India, and I very very rarely discuss politics or religion here. Yeah. But I think partly it's also, if you look at something like the black market here, without the black market, you know, the Indian economy would fall apart. It's entrenched in, in the way people live and, mm. and everybody is in some way um, feeding the black market. And it's not until it gets to the, the larger moneyed issues, you know, where it, where it becomes a real problem. But I mean, gosh, in Mumbai, you could stand on the street at three in the morning and a bike will ride past and you say, cigarette, and they can sell you a cigarette, you know, and it's generally black market. And I've been here nine years. I've seen the increase of credit cards, mm. you know, the increase of the, the loan mentality, which is terrible. You know, yeah. we, we as people from the West who have had access to that for a long time, we know the trap, you know, 100%. of credit. It's terrible, but you can see it happening here. And it's, it's almost like that vampiric notion of eternal life if you've got a credit card. You know? Yeah. You know, it's interesting watching um, India expand into the world. Politics and religion is like taboo topics. I'm acutely aware that I am the other when I'm here. I'm the foreigner. It doesn't live in my soul. The, the, the... Hello, Didi. Hi. <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm always very, very aware that I'm the other, I'm the guest. It's my privilege to be here. Politics and religion, you know, it's something that I'm, I sit outside of and certainly I can comment on it, but I'm, I remain aware that I'm, I'm outside of that and looking in. So even after nine years, you're like not fully integrated. So there is this gap between like foreigners. Yeah, of and course. Others. I mean, my Hindi is very thoda thoda, very small. <laughs> um, so the language barrier still exists. Things that it's a country of festivals and a country of thousands of gods, and they're they're not ingrained in me. So I'm in Australia. I, I'm very aware of when Christmas is coming or Easter is coming, but all the festivals here they're not 
part of my soul. They're, they're yeah. not, you know, deeply entrenched in me. Yeah, and also I'm, I'm white. There's huge discussions around that issue of um, the perception of a white person. I met a, I was talking to an Indian chap the other day and he said, well, you know, yeah, we hate all white people, you know, and we want what you've got. <laughs> you know, and he wasn't coming from a, a really nasty perspective, but it, um, there was a, a little bit of a truth in there that the expectation that I'm very wealthy very much exists, which I'm not, you know, I, I freelance in the arts. So those kind of expectations of, of from the color of my skin, I find beautifully challenging. I really like the fact that it's made me very aware of being the, um, the minority, and I think that's good for people. I think it's really, really healthy to, to be the minority for a moment, to develop your empathies and to develop um, patience, I suppose, as well. And especially when you are the guest in the country, it's not my right to criticise somebody for not speaking good enough English to understand me. It's my fault. You know, I don't speak good enough Hindi to, to make myself understood. I enjoy that as part of my life at the moment, of, of being aware of those kind of things. I was... Out in Malad, there's a very, very busy street corner called With Chalky, and I was crossing it and I got hit by a motorbike. Mm. Like, hit to the floor, mm. you know, and the bike rider went, oh my God, it's a white person, and just took off in case I made a big complaint. It was my area, so the, the shopkeeper that I knew quite well came out and helped me up, and I was, yeah, you bastard. And um, he said, ah, Glenn, yeah. it was his fault, but it was your responsibility. This is several years ago now, yeah. in my first couple of years here, and it was one of the first big moments that I went, oh, okay, there's, there's different mindsets coming from a, a culture in Australia where it is about blame, where it is about, is it? you know... Yeah. Well, I mean, I think everywhere in the West where we, we yeah. have our legal like systems... Real, like real speech. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah. If yeah. you're, you know, if and you're not happy with something, you Yeah, saying. and if you did something wrong, then you're the, you're the bad guy. And we have all those laws and, and insurances, you know. Yeah. Insurance companies have a lot to do with how law is set up, I think. Yeah, being in an environment where um, all those ingrained attitudes are challenged daily mm. is healthy. I think yeah. it's very, very healthy. It keeps me young. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they rent this space out down here for parties, so we get a lot of weddings and oh. um, things. There was a two-year-old's birthday party there, and I've never seen so much money spent on a two-year-old. <laughs> and the kid won't remember. It's ridiculous. Like, oh, it's, it's I so have hard. kids, but like, what's oh, a year old? They don't, they don't understand anything. No, of course like, not. Like, starting four, maybe you do yeah, something like yeah. meaningful. Exactly. <laughs> Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> the maid culture has been a really weird thing for me because we don't grow up with maids or cooks, you know, in Australia. No one can afford it, you know, and all of a sudden living in a culture where it's not just affordable, but um, the expectation is to give someone employment. And I really like that. Well, I've spoken to many Indians who have said, no, 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 it's our duty to employ someone. And I really like that. Mm. I think it's fantastic. Because labor is such a different thing here. I mean, in, in Australia, you pay for time. Here, you pay for the job. So the job could take 10 hours, but it costs the same. Whereas in Australia, the plumber knocks on your door and it's 90 bucks. <laughs> you know? So that's been really interesting as well. And it makes your life so much easier. Oh, it's right? fantastic. You focus you know. on the things that you want to focus on. And it's also that thing of it's, it's purely practical. In Mumbai, you have to have your floors done every day because of the dust. You just have to. You know, in Australia, we'll mop, you know, as far as the hall goes and bedroom thing, you do it every few days, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But here, if you don't do it every day, then you've got dust. And we live in a house with lots of windows, so there's a lot of dust coming in. It's practical as well. There's three things I miss from Australia. Okay, tell me. Cheese, <laughs> beef, and a proper stove. Like a good yeah. Western stove with a good oven. Yeah. Because I like baking, I like cooking, and that's our oven. <laughs> it's like, ah! So I, I miss that a lot. Uh, like beef, you cannot buy, like, no chance you buy beef you or, can or you can. Market, but usually it's buffalo, not beef. Yeah. yeah so, um, and good cheese, it's just so expensive. You can go to Nature's Basket and things, mm. but it's really expensive. A lot of Indian, especially guys, will say, well, you can cook. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I've been cooking since I was 10. You, know, was like, you don't cook, you don't eat. You go, oh, God, that's amazing. And the amount of people, you know, when they're in their late 20s who can't even fry an egg, they go, wow, that's, that's incredible. And it's not through privilege. It's just through lifestyle in a different country. The patriarchal system here is very prevalent, but there's also a tenderness amongst men here, which um, doesn't exist in Australia, certainly, or as, as a nation, you know, so that's been really interesting to observe and, and to be part of. It's certainly a country where if you're a man, you are privileged, which I think is a global thing anyway. I mean, God, Hollywood still debates whether, you know, yeah. uh, pay rights, you know, for women and men. So it's nothing different from the rest of the world. I think there's still a lot of sectors here where what dad says goes. Mm. You know, you will marry this person. 
um, you or you won't marry that person more so. And I think men here have a lot more of a, a social connect with each other. There's always the cliche in, in the West where if the husband dies first, the woman is generally socially okay and supported. Whereas if the wife dies first, the, the husband usually is quite lost. And the cliche is that you know in the West, women get together and discuss more and are much more open and, and, yeah. and talk about feelings. And whereas the men don't. Again, I'm, I'm talking very generally and, and probably from a 19, 90s perspective. Um, but here the, the, the men have a very, very strong social connect. Very, and, and I think um, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's really nice to be part of and to be invited into that is, is really lovely. I think again, just because of space, I mean, people here grow up with 10, 12 people sleeping in one room. You can't avoid that sort of non-sexual intimacy either. If you're sleeping you know, with a bunch of people in a room, then, then intimacy will occur. And I'm not talking about sex, but yeah. just um, being, being open in yourself. It's interesting what is expected of me as a man, and some people are quite shocked. I was in a rickshaw once and he said, oh, you, you have wife and children? I said, no, 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 I'm a single man. He said, what? He said, huh? he said what's wrong with you? <laughs> and it was this incredible, you know, my God, you're, you're a grown man and you have no family. Yeah. And his closing comment was, no wife, no life. <laughs> you know? And it's, it's so interesting to hear somebody saying that from a very, very true place, a very true place for him. Whereas I'm an Australian kid, grew up in the 80s, you know, punk, gay, sex decriminalised, you know, in the 80s. I, uh, I mean, we've had that kind of freedom in, in the West where, especially choice of partner, choice of marriage, mm. choice of children or not, and that's happening now here. So that, that revolution is, is now happening here, um, mm. and it's exciting to be able to observe that yeah. and to see some of my friends going through that, especially because I teach, so I, I'm, seeing, I'm spending a lot of time with early 20s people, and they are the new India. Attitude is changing. What's the attitude towards LGBT? people here. The law has just recently changed a couple of years ago. So section 377 was overturned, which, which was criminalizing gay sex, basically. It's still very, very fresh in India. And, you know, you can change law, but it's, it's hard to change attitude. It's mm. hard to change people's personal perspective. And, and I saw that happen in Australia. I mean, mm. I grew up as a criminal mm. in Perth until the mid-80s or late 80s. Yeah. You know, when it was decriminalized. So I understand that, that sense of one day you're a criminal, the next day you're not. But still, your family will still be disgusted or supportive or curious, you know I mean? So all that is happening here now where law has changed, but attitude hasn't quite changed fully yet. So there's a lot of closeted people here. A lot of gay people are in the, in the closet. I've met several young guys who their parents have said you have to get married so they get married and I was talking to one guy I had a really big argument with him and he was I knew he was gay and he got married and had a child and I said so are you still going out dating guys and he went yeah 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 I said so do you let your wife have affairs and he went no she's my wife and so I said, wife but, is more like a social status and something yeah and I said but isn't that unfair he said no no, no I did my duty I said, what was your duty? He said, I gave her a baby. So that still exists here. But then there's the flip side where there's these beautiful, 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 brave young people who, you know, and middle-aged and older people who are very, very out and proud. I mean, the gay pride marches and get thousands of people, but it's a city of 27 million people. So, yeah. you know, the thousands of people is a very, very small yeah. pocket. It's just changing. It's in evolution and mm. it's exciting to be to be part of that. And it's easy for me as a, as a Westerner, who's, I mean, I've never been in, I've, I've been gay all my life. It's very easy for me to be more myself and not, not fear retribution. I mean, I don't run around screaming, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay, you know, I mean, and I wouldn't do that in Australia either. Yeah. But I, I can be very secure in myself. If somebody asks me, I generally tell them. But as a foreigner, I can be very secure in that. Because it's almost like the expectation is that you're, there's a lot of perception about Westerners that we do everything sexually, that we're really perverse and really naughty. And, yeah, and it's, that's it's, the perception there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really quite bizarre. And I suppose it's because, you know, mostly they see porn, you know, or mm. um, if there is sex involved, you know, these, these sort of um, extreme films and things. So yeah, the perception is that you know you're really, really deviant, and you're not. You know, <laughs> not everyone is. Interesting, like you said about 377 law in Singapore, there is also like 377A huh. law. Yeah. I, I guess it's from Brit from Britain. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. It is absolutely said, said by British. Absolutely, <laughs> it is. This is our kitchen, which is cool. 
So it's a pretty it, large kitchen. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's what I love about this apartment. It, it's bigger than than um, usual for this area and for the price. Yeah. And having the balconies is fantastic. Do you use the balcony a lot? Um, not. Oh, look, I suppose I, I come out here for my morning cigarette. It's quite nice watching our street wake up. But yeah, it's a little bit of a dumping area. How does it work in India? So when you rent a place, people before you rent it before you, they need to give it away the same condition? Coming from Australia where rental is so regulated and properties are very, very much the, the landlord's um, responsibility to keep up. Here there's a lot of tendency of, well, you want something done, you do it yourself. Homes in Mumbai, is um, the real estate is just not regulated at all. And the broker. The whole broker thing um, is annoying. You know, yeah. we, we just re-signed our lease and we have to pay the broker again, you know, and he's done nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and you pay again. Yeah. 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 So for signing the paper, we pay the broker again the yeah. same amount we paid for him to find the flat. And then normally you rent for like one year, two year? Uh, this track? one we're signing up for 11 months. They're generally 11 months. What's the range of prices for this kind of size apartment so this in this is, area? This is actually a good price. Um, when we moved in it was 37,000 rupee a month and we've just gone up to 40, which is actually quite good. It's actually quite a, a well laid out flat. It's quite large in yeah. comparison to a lot of places around here, which is great. And there's only three of us, so there's two of us in one room, one in the other. So it's called a 2BHK. Two bedroom hall, as they call it, and kitchen. Yeah. Uh, this is living room or it's a hall? Yeah, so what we call in Australia the lounge room, yeah. um, others call the living room, here it's called the hall. And a lot of, I mean, especially in my field in the arts, um, especially young artists, they'll have two or three people also sleeping in the hall. Which, it's interesting because psychologically, you know, coming from Australia, we we have our own bedroom from a very, very young age. You, you don't have people sleeping in, your, in yeah. your lounge room. Even when you're in student housing, people aren't sleeping in your lounge room. But here, I mean, I think purely because of population, I mean, it's a city of 27 million people. I actually love being one amongst 27 million people. Uh, I love it. And also to be, because I'm not from here, you can disappear. You, exactly, I, yeah. I love that, I love it. And I think that's partly why I don't mix with a lot of other foreigners here, because I, I like being not the one to be looked at, but the one to disappear. I and see I, what you mean. I really I enjoy mean. it, really enjoy it. Why do you think Bollywood is such a big thing? Can you compare it to Hollywood? Maybe not now, but Hollywood or like in the 80s in, in the US. From what I hear, economically, Bollywood is on a downward slide, which I think is happening with cinema all over the place because of um, online access. Um, I mean, Bollywood is so incredibly entrenched in this culture. It's incredible. I think much, much more so than Hollywood. Mm. And I think it's partly the formula is what people love. I mean, whatever the Bollywood film, there is a song. Exactly, you yeah. know, and a dance. And, and a dance, yeah. and it's formula. And if it wasn't there, it would be a bad Bollywood film. You know, and people would be incredibly disappointed. So I think the formula of Bollywood is, is partly what, what the attraction is. I think also um, Bollywood, what going to a, a movie in the 50s, 60s, like everywhere I suppose, it's, it's about the community coming together and rejoicing. And there is a guru mentality here where people here do like to, to put people up on a, on a high pedestal. And so celebrity here is like 10 times more yeah. than, than what I've seen in the West. You know, it's incredible. <laughs> How would you compare like Melbourne with Mumbai? How rich Mumbai cultural scene of theatre? The, the culture here broadly on, across all arts yeah. is incredibly rich, incredibly rich. From an industry perspective, it's all about film here. Film, 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 Bollywood, Bollywood, Bollywood. Theatre is very much the poor cousin here, which it is in, in other countries, but um, more so here. A lot of people doing theatre are working for either free or very, very little. The idea of producing theatre here is only really, as an industry, has only really started being prevalent in the last sort of five years, I suppose. For example, a really good example is venues here, and there's some beautiful theatres here. They act as landlords to theatre rather than part of the industry. So in Australia, if I rehearse a play for four weeks or three weeks, then you have a whole week in the theatre to get ready for the first audience. Here, you get four hours or one day. Where that affects the art is that you can't have a big design, set yeah. design, because you don't have any time to put it in. And the actors here work very, very, very fast and they adapt incredibly fast, much faster than I've seen Australians oh, adapt. Okay. Because they have to. I mean, we're used to having a week. They were used to having four hours. So I'm just about to direct um, A Midsummer Night's Dream for the Royal Opera House. And yeah, I've got four hours to put my, my set, my actors, my lighting, my sound. 
It's insane. From my yeah. perspective, it's insane. Everyone else is like, eh, we'll deal with it. <laughs> There's a saying, a word here called jugad, and jugad is um, you have a big mess, and you work out how to make something beautiful out of it. You, know, <laughs> you, you use tricks, you use gaffer tape, yeah. you know, it's, it's all jugad. My bugbear, which I'm, I'm quite vocal about, is that venues need to start realising that they are part of the art, not just the landlords of the art. What are the biggest challenges to work with local actors? Because film is the ultimate for most actors here, I'd say 99.9% of the actors here, you can lose actors very quickly because they get a film. So commitment to, to a project can yeah. be quite problematic. One of the problems in the industry here is there's a lot of people who have read an acting book and then think they can teach it and they charge very, very little. And they create competition. Yeah, and, well, and yeah they create a false competition, false competition because it's yeah. crap what they're doing. But students are going, yeah, but they only charge this much, so why are you charging that much? It's like, yeah. cause 40 years in the industry and you know, I know what the f I'm talking about. How does it feel to be like 59 and turning 60? I don't need much more. I suppose, yeah. which is really nice. It's probably the only good thing about getting old. Oh, getting old sucks. <laughs> you know, I mean, those people that say, you know, getting old is a privilege, getting old, it's bullshit. Getting old is horrible. Your yeah. body's decaying, you're socially, you're, you're you know, seen as something completely different in a, in a social stratus now. And, um, but the nice thing is, is that you need less, which is great. Well, for me anyway. Mentally, I'm still sort of back in 27. I enjoy the fact that I know more. I enjoy mm. the fact that I need less. I enjoy the fact that I can say no comfortably and without imposing any repercussion of saying no, which we do. I think we, we impose that on ourselves when we're younger. If I say no, I'm going to miss out on another job. If I, if I say no, I'm going to yeah. make that person angry. Now I go, eh, it's <laughs> their problem. It's yeah. not my problem. You know, I, I, I stupidly once thought, okay, if it takes X amount of time to do one project, and I sort of worked out how many projects I had left in my life. <laughs> I went, oh my God, I've got to work much harder. It's that really weird re realization that there's more years behind you than there are in front of you. That's a real freak out because we do think we're immortal when we're young. We, we, we do think we have absolute immortality. Um, pretty okay with this idea of getting older and, and dying one day. And I think what it does is magnifies the fact that now is the most important time in your life. Right now. Right now. Yeah. The past doesn't exist anymore. The future is a fantasy. Right now is what's the most important thing in your life. And I love that. I really, I, I've em embraced that wholeheartedly. What's for you the, the meaning of life? And for me personally, the meaning of life is to, um, is to give. I suppose, whether it's my plays or my teaching or my discussions. And through that giving, you get to take a lot, which is great. <laughs> a young student asked me, said, Glenn, what's, what, what do you think the meaning of life is? You know, well, how should I live my life? And I was feeling slightly um, naughty at that stage. I said, look, learn how to manage money as quick as possible. Spend as much of that money as possible to realise that you're okay whether it's in therapy or whatever. Spend the money to find out as young as possible that you are okay and have as much sex as possible. <laughs> oh, you are so sweet. Thanks for watching the next video. Yeah, right here, this one. Thank you again and see you there.